Welcome to another episode of Crime Page of Botany Does It. I'm here in a private ranch in Star County, Texas. We're going to go check out some very rare cactus species, including a magnificent clump of the endangered star cactus, Astrophyta mysterious. We'll see some peyote, and we'll see some remarkable habitat that's disappearing from this region and may be gone by mid-century, if not sooner. A lot of development, you know, ongoing patterns of drought, heat, etc. So uh, let's go check it out. Got nothing like the thorn scrub after a rain. Look at that. Look at that beautiful black brush. Multiple stems. Easily confused with Texas ebony, but doesn't get as big. And the leaflets have a tiny accumulate point that sometimes is almost not noticeable. But lots of, uh, lots of yotes coming up. Thriving here. God, the ground is still moist too, this soil. So it's so special. It's just, oh, this clay. Look at those little guys. What a special habitat, what a special place. God, we need a dam. We need a big preserve with a nice visitor center. You know, we're going to try to do that. Set up a nonprofit, get your visitor center, and interpret a bunch of interpretive signs, labels for the plants. You have a nice little bookshop there. I'll be monitored. You know, poachers will be flogged. But, uh, just an, an increasingly endangered ecosystem and underappreciated too and so unique only place in the united states that this occurs is in south texas beautiful yo beautiful so plump and juicy with that chalky blue that wax epicuticular wax beautiful coriphantha macromeris as well with those pink flowers when they go off look at how prominent those tubercles are you see this growing in shade a lot, but in cultivation it can do fine with a lot more sun. You know, as long as you can water once in a while during the hottest balls of summer they get down here. Nice little clump of yotes. Can't tell if it's one that got cut and then re-sprouted or if it's just a bunch of seedlings. I can hear the grackles going nuts. Look at it's not a shred of buffalo grass to be seen anywhere. There's a mesquite. You can see how dwarfed it's grown because of how hot it is in the summer. Beautiful yucca, too. But see, this soil is what makes everything. This clay soil, all right? Calcareous-based soil, weathered out of limestone. Nice little clump of yotes right there, hiding in the shade. No invasives, almost just bare ground everywhere, but you've got this uh, this lichen and cyanobacteria. And, uh, oh, there's even that weird liverwort here. Yeah, there's that liverwort. You see that? This fucking weird. No one knows what species it is. But it's got a beautiful kind of bluish green, almost turquoise luster to it. And uh, you won't even notice it unless it's rained recently. But it grows St. Patrick with uh, the peyote. At a few spots down here in beautiful Stark County. What's that, a nice Castilla over there? Look at that. See, pardon, pardon the barking, we got a posse of chihuahuas here, and Cistro cactus, there we go, which of course forms those little tubers, those little potatoes, about six inches below the stem, and those tubers are what enable these guys to grow without any shade, just out open exposed, and Cistro cactus and Thilo cactus are two of the most sturdy, tough cacti, low-growing cactus species that we get down here in the Rio Grande Valley. Hey, I didn't do nothing to you. Relax, buddy. See those curved uh, hooks on the, those curved fish hooks on the distal ends of the spines, though? And then kind of like golden radial spines. That's Ancestro cactus. I like the flowers when they go off, too. A lot of people don't think they're too nice. I think they're pretty. I think they're bangers. But look at that. No buffalo grass. Yeah, there's a little bit over there. Look at this hibiscus marcianus. Beautiful red flowers when it goes off. All right, a true hibiscus, a desert hibiscus. They top out at like three or four feet. See, they're growing in the shade here. In cultivation, they need full sun. And then growing beneath another shrub that looks like so many of the other shrubs down here, so many of the plants, they all do this, this fascicle thing. See that? Leaf fascicles, no petioles. This is Schaeferia cunifolia, Celestraces, the family. Looks like so many. It looks like three or four other unrelated plants here. But growing beneath that, got this magnificent clump of peyote. Look at the beautiful color on that. And look at how important that calcareous mud is too. Half covered in lichens. All that black stuff is lichens. That's all a living soil crust. Got a nice guayacan right here. Zygophilaceae is the family on that one, the creosote family. Guayacum angustifolium. Almost looks like a pea with those pinnate leaves. 
These can get upwards. I've seen them, you know, 14 feet tall in Weibo Leon, old growth, but they grow very slow. Look, look, there's the Nostock. It's still wet. It hasn't turned into that uh, black crust yet. A cyanobacterial film, a photosynthetic bacteria. Looks like someone blew their nose. Look at this massive clump of Coryphantha macromeris. It's got a two and a half foot spread. A two and a half foot spread. And illustrious pink flowers when it, uh, when it blooms. Look, you can, look, such a privilege to be in its habitat. Look at that. There's Coryphantha open and exposed, sun exposed. Just started some of these from seed. We got to grow more of this. We got to get more people out here. We got to get people preserving this, learning about it, caring about it. Then we're going to open up the visitor center when we start our nonprofit. We're going to have wonderful bathrooms in there, okay? Tile bathrooms, some nice paintings and stuff on a wall. They'll be nailed down so they can't be stolen, okay? Because you just know, got that Chicago mentality. You know, they'll steal anything that's not nailed down. But we're going to have a, a wonderful visitor center with the excellent bathroom in there and interpretive signs and trails and an informational kiosk. Oh, God. It's like getting recharged coming out here. Puts me in a good mood. Now I can go sit in a you know, fucking parking lot in a strip mall for, you know, 20 minutes if I need to. It won't bum me out at all. This is, you know, I come out here so I can actually, you know, exist in the world without uh, wanting to choke myself. Look at that. Multiple stems on the black brush, right? Unlike the ebony, too, which is just a single trunk off of it. But multiple stems on the black brush. But they do look alike. But look at all the lichen that's already growing on this. These cool lichen communities. I mean, this is nothing. I've seen it just covered in beards of lichen. There we go. The Xiphus obtusifolius. Now it's Sarcomphalus. Because I guess, I don't know what the hell they changed. It was, there's a, the Xiphus is an old world genus, too. And, you know, it's not surprising that the, you know, Atlantic Ocean is a big, uh, you know, barrier to speciation, of course. Or I guess the Pacific, because I think the old world genus is in Asia, but regardless, they changed the New World ones to Sarcomphalus or Sarcombatus or something. I don't know. Sarco something. All you got to know is it's in the Buckthorn family, Ramnaceae. And if you look at those stems, you can see those, you know, very, uh, very subtle ridges and striations along those photosynthetic stems. The leaves are tiny, of course. This thing has been adapted to grow in, uh, in the desert, you know, and the, the brutal heat here. Just go dormant. Very, very wonderful plant. Spiny as hell, but when it goes off, very important for the pollinators. And then here we go with probably the largest clump of star cactus. And I think these are all individuals because they, uh, you know, it does, star cactus doesn't pup. Of course, Astrophyta mysterious doesn't pup. But you can see right there what's going on. I mean, this thing is massive. I was here three years ago. This is a private ranch, and this thing was not even half this size. But it does appear some of the individuals have died. But uh, you could see there's 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 a, more than enough recruitment. The landowner keeps these little grates over them because the conejos, the rabbits, were going to town on them for a while. But uh, it appears uh, the bitter tasting alkaloids in that cactus have been more than enough to keep the rabbits away. But just Christ, look at it! Ah, oh. and this landowner was really nice too. She let us get some uh, seeds a few years ago, and so now there's ample stock plants growing by a friend of mine for restoration purposes. To plant them back in a ground because this this species needs conservation more than any any other right now in the region because uh, it doesn't have that big taproot that peyote has so they're very susceptible to drought surprisingly susceptible to drought very curious though because you'll frequently see these growing open and exposed just sunk into the ground and these pebble these rolling hills of pebbles that uh, were probably deposited by the river you know i don't know a million years ago maybe fifteen thousand years ago 500 who, who the hell knows but they're rounded, so they spend time in water, those little pebbles. But you'll see that's, that's where this thing grows. You know, you go to some of these preserves, you just see it growing flat on these undulating hills. God damn, look at it. Look, I love this plant. What a marvelous species. Way more in cultivation than there are in the wild. And the Japanese are doing some incredible breeding. The Japanese and the Thai are doing some incredible breeding with this. All right? Because, you know, every once in a while you grow a thousand seeds, some of, the, some of the seedlings, some of the individuals will have those trichomes accentuated. They'll have more of those little white speckled dots, which are just trichomes, than the others. And so you, then you take those, you selectively breed those two together. You know, it, you get recessive alleles, dominant alleles, those are just copies of a gene. Uh, you're basically pulling out those recessive alleles. You get two copies of recessive alleles, now you're homozygous, all right? Instead, if you got recessive and dominant, you got recessive and dominant, your heterozygous, the dominant's going to overtake. You got two copies of those recessive alleles, now you're homozygous for the recessive trait, and that'll bring out those weird, just incredibly bizarre patterns on that, uh, that flattened stem. 
Holy hell, I didn't even realize I'm standing on top of a ceiling. Ample recruitment here. And again, this soil is so important to the recruitment of these plants. You see that? Behaves totally differently in a pot. But you can see it's like this sandy loam. It's sandy loam and clay. And it rained here three days ago, but it's still wet. It holds on to moisture. So it's a great seed bed for these plants. You try to put it in a pot, of course, so it behaves totally different in a pot versus in the ground where it's got this massive expanse. Water can move all through it. But uh, in a pot, you know, you got a, less of a volume of soil. It's totally different. But obviously, they're doing very well here. You could see seedlings popping up everywhere. There's a nice little yoat, too. See that? You see the nice little yoat over there? Look at it. Look, that chihuahua was just standing on top of the mountain of astrophytum. You ever seen that before? I bet you've never seen a chihuahua stand on top of a mountain of a rare and beautiful cactus. And being that these are dioecious, they're not self-fertile. You need two individuals for cross-pollination. Yeah, obviously, with this many individuals growing here, you know, you get a, you get a good rain here. You know, they bloom roughly in March. You're going to get a lot of cross-pollination, a lot of fruit, a lot of seed. Just blows, it just, what blows my mind though is, you know, anyone in the area could do this. You get a couple plants, get from, get, you know, buy them seed grow and stick them in the ground. You could start breeding them, you get a seed stock. You're basically doing rare plant conservation in your damn yard. Get rid of your lawn, start planting this stuff. This is the habitat we're losing. This is what we need. Okay, you know, and I just got some clarification as to why this is growing here in the shade because you rarely ever see astrophytum growing in the shade of a tree like this. These were actually moved by the landowner who purchased the ranch, you know, sometime, I don't know, 20 years ago in the 2000s, and they brought two plants, two individuals from the barren plains where they grow, which are a little bit east out of here, you know, still on ranch property, and planted them here, and it's just thrived, it's taken off. So that's kind of new, that's new to me. I mean, this all, this all was initially two plants that she planted, and now you can see what it's turned into. You've got all the rest is just, you know, natural seedling recruitment. Mind-blowing, look at it. How do those seeds how do those seeds get over there? Astrophytum seeds are very large for a cactus seed. So they got a lot of they got a lot of that juicy endosperm in there to feed the developing seedlings. Right? And they grow fast as hell too. I mean it's why I mean you can get a plant that's the size of a grapefruit in, in three years from seed, maybe less. Less if you graft them. Look at it, the snout showed up. Look at that. They're passing through their host plant is a, oh there's a multitude of butterflies here. Their host plant is a Celtus. You can see those guys. See, see what I call them? The snout? You get that long Pinocchio nose on them. See that? Oh, this thing. There you go. Coma Sideroxylon Celestrinum Sapitaceae. Produces edible fruit. Kind of gummy. Got like a... Feel, you squish them. It feels like glue comes out. There's those flowers. You can smell them from 10 feet away. Everybody should be planting this in their yard. It's got those little spines, but when you, when it's going off, it's like a natural fragrance. All right? It smells like a nice bathroom spritz. You could smell it from 15, 10, 15 feet away. Look, the snouts are loving it too. Look at all the butterflies. Holy shit. Okay, so still escorted by the posse of chihuahuas, you can see the habitat changes from the brush to this more open and exposed muddy flats. And over there is where the actual star cactus grows. That's the actual habitat of astrophytum. And you see this plant everywhere that's Varilla texana. That's a succulent member of the sunflower family of Asteraceae. Frequently acts as a cover for astrophytum. And you could see, look, the drastic change in habitat. Who knows what's going on with the soil down there, but you could see the scrub kind of tapers off and this, the varilla becomes dominant. We didn't see any varilla down there. And now the varilla is out in full force. Opuntia lindheimeri or Anglomania, or whatever the hell they're calling it these days is still, still here, still doing well. But oh, look, you got a nice, some of those flowers on that, uh, on that varilla. See that? It's like a daisy without the rays. But still, the same principle as Asteraceae, just a bunch of tiny flowers forming a composite head that resembles one flower. Look at those leaves, like succulent little fingers. Varilla texana, two species in that genus. It's in the marigold tribe of Asteraceae. There you go. Now this is where the magic starts to happen. You start seeing Thelocactus. With ancestral cactus, Thelocactus, aka the Gloria Texas cactus, is one of the most drought tolerant, tough motherfuckers of a plant that we get down here in South Texas. Frequently grows, just sun exposed, no shade cover, no nurse cover, bright pink flowers when it goes off. Over there you can see a kind of serious fitchii as well, which also does not tolerate shade. And they're both thriving here. And then laying in wait for us to find it, we've got a bunch of individuals of Astrophytum Asterius, the magnificent star cactus. But look at this stuff. I mean, it's just, I've been out here before when it's just, I mean, it's wet now, but this, this clay turns into 
just brutal mud. I mean, really, there you go. Look at that. Just thick, thick mud. And there you go. Astrophyta mysterious, everybody. Look at that. There you go. Growing open and exposed. See that? Thriving. Full exposure. How do they do it? They don't have that storage route that peyote does. How does it how does it do so well there? But growing sympatrically with Varilla Texana. Kill your lawn and put in a cactus garden. Grow Varilla Texana and Astrophytum. <laughs> I would love to see somebody do that. God, it'd be it's a little too much to ask for given what people plant down here. You know, everyone wants that, that corny ass lawn, even though we live in a desert. But you could do this, you know. There you go. There's see I, this always happens. I'm taking I'm taking videos. Look at that massive, looks like a cow patty of an astrophyte. I'm gotta be six inches across. I'm always taking photos and I never notice the ones I'm standing right on top of. Okay, we got some Chihuahua beef. They're having an altercation. I'm not gonna break it up. I'll just let it let them figure it out for themselves. But here's the habitat. And then to give you a zoom in of what we're doing, you can see this crust all over this this sandy loam clay soil, and there's a little seedling right there, and they just start appearing. All right, and the, uh, the varilla is sporadic, forming little islands. Looks like you got a little mimosa right there, one of the mimosa species. And uh, again, there's those massive old bastards. Look at that. A little bit yellow from the summer, but they're coming out of it okay. You, know, you can see from my feet, you know, the, the soil. My feet are caked in mud, of course, what the soil is like. Let's take a look over here, see what else we got going on. We can see a nice little colony of uh, Petropha dioica, another important plant here. Oh yeah, look at that. These form massive, they, I think they use this for toothaches medicinally, but it forms these massive tubers in the ground. It's in the Euphorbia family. Hotropha dioica. See, that's all you need. You get some nice, you put this in a conservation easement, get a piece of private like this, put it in a conservation easement. It's got old growth astrophytum on it. And uh, you know, you build a nice visitor center, with the little cafe, pizzeria, really nice bathroom. You know, you got like Polaroid wall full of all the people who've tried to poach that you've caught and flogged, you know. They get like a band list, you know, kind of like a bar has, you know. It was in a bar called, I think it was called the Green Room, Providence, Rhode Island. Once they had that, you know, they showed everyone who'd been banned, but they didn't, they weren't permanent bans. They only banned for a couple weeks. It was the name of the person, their Polaroid of, of, of them, who got banned, and then how many weeks they were banned for. Did this mesquite not make it? What did, what, why did it not have what it takes to cut it in this environment? Is it the floods? Is it the saline soil? Varilla does frequently grow in salty soil. That's why they call it saladio. But more importantly, what can we do to establish an astrophytum garden in your yard once you kill your lawn? If you live in South Texas, kill your lawn. Just kill the shit out of your lawn. You could sugarcoat it. You could say you're just removing it. You could do whatever you want to do. But you got to get rid of it. You got to get rid of it. It makes no sense to have a goddamn lawn in a desert. And uh, you put some of this stuff in. Conserve rare plants. Once they go in the ground, they're safe. You just got to weed occasionally. Maybe maybe use some rock mulch. You could even water it once or twice in the summer during a dry spell. Look at that. Look at these guys over there. Why are more people not... I want to see some astrophytum gardens. You know, get the get the varilla. Get the, uh, the mimosa. You could even put in some uh, tasajillo. You don't have to. Look at the thilo cactus. You got full sun. Do it. Conserve rare plants in your yard because this this habitat is disappearing. It's getting bulldozed for Starbucks and McMansions and all kinds of other goofy shit that's uh, part of our great race to nowhere. Privileged to be here with you today, Astro Fighting. You can see a little rhabdotus shell. It's a desert snail. Pretty amazing. You, you know, uh, the native people here, whether it was the Kohiltekans or whatever, would frequently make necklaces. There's really a lot of drama going on with those chihuahuas. We're just going to ignore it and let them figure it out. Look at that little, uh, look at that little seedling popping up. And then there's one that didn't make it for whatever reason. The drought got them, but then these do. So I don't know. It's it's a weird uh, so look. And that right there, I was wrong. That's not a mimosa. That's a uh, Prosopis reptans. I think they changed the name to Neltuma now, but it's got a little screwbean uh, seed pod. Not to be confused with the screwbean mesquite that you'll actually see in places like New Mexico. This one doesn't get taller. This particular species doesn't get taller than that eight inches right there. Yeah, the fruits on these are really something else, man. Look at it. You got those glaucous leaves with those, the, still that pinnate the bean foliage. Look who's hanging out right there, too. Our old friend Mammillaria hyderi, which we haven't seen yet. I've seen a couple individuals along the trail, but I didn't stop to video them yet until now. That thelocactus is really something else. We even got a grusonia, a dog choya. That's a mean bastard. But again, look at this soil. The whole crust here 
is alive. This is all lichen, cyanobacteria, algae. Oh, look, these little mud tubes that the termites build. All right, it's actually a combination of uh, feces and mud. Oh, yeah, see? There they are. You can see them uh, popping out from around it. But they do that basically because, you know, they're desert termites. They build these little mud cases around the vegetation that they're slowly taking apart, and they help recycle the nutrients. Same thing fire does in the prairie, you know? Getting rid of the, the dead stuff. Got a massive old... God damn, that's nice. There, see them little termites? See, they only go for dead stuff. They're like they're like fung fungi, you know? Well, saprotrophic fungi, at least. They're just recyclers. They're not going to take apart your house. Not these guys. They're going for dead veg, and they help recycle it. Very important. They got the, all those different bacterial species in their gut that help them. do. What is this going on with this guy? Why is he struggling? He keeps falling on his back. I don't know what he's doing. Maybe he's drunk or something. But you'll see this. I remember going to a park once, and they had Bermuda grass as their, their substrate. And the Bermuda grass was all dead. It was, you know, this is actually just a month ago because of that uh, that drought we came through. And, and the Bermuda grass was all dead, and it was just these little mud tunnels. This, these mud tunnels had encrusted everything. You can see that. They build these mud tunnels around the vegetation there. They're taken apart. Building their little tubes around the veg. In this case, it's Monantha chloe, that salt-tolerant grass, which you get near the coast. But they're not taken at all. I mean, it's only the dead stuff. Do they go for living veg at all? I can't tell. It seems like they're mostly going for dead because this living stuff is still still there. But, you know, a whole biotic community right here. Look closer, you see a lot of cool stuff. You know, that's the problem. There's no one's paying attention anymore. You know, especially down here. It's, it's so hot. It's so goddamn hot down here. Everyone's hanging out in AC staring at their phones. You know, but now the winter is the nice season. You get five months when you can actually go outside without melting. Look at a kind of serious fitchy guy. What a beast. What a beaut. So we do, we've got a drastic habitat change from where we just were, which was more thorn scrub, thick thorn scrub. Down here, it's more open, exposed, and you're starting to see a lot of salt tolerant plants. So that's kind of, that's kind of an important clue to the puzzle. We're, more, we're lower lying, we're a few feet elevation below where we were. There's more salt here, it being a desert. Evapotranspiration uh, is uh, is drastically increased. Well, it's actually evaporation. Evapotranspiration is increased through the plants, of course, the, through the stomata, but evaporation from the ground is drastically increased because it's hot and it's so it's dry for so long right, during the summer. And so that, of course, you get water pooling up, the, you know, bringing with it all these solutes, all these minerals in it, and as it evaporates, it, you know, goes back up into the atmosphere and precipitates the minerals behind, and uh, that's when you get all this salts, all these, all these all these salts precipitating out. And so that's where you get all these salt tolerant plants like the varilla and that the Monantha chloe, that grass, that, you know, Monantha chloe littoralis, which you normally only get, it's coastal, again, salt tolerant. And, uh, and the astrophytum, all right? So look at that. There's a big, there's a tiny little astrophytum seedling. You know, there's a tiny little astrophytum seedling next to the ant mound. I'm not gonna, I don't know what species of ant that is, but I'm not gonna mess with them. So notice what a hard time the mesquites are having. They're growing stunted. If they're growing at all, a bunch have died. It's apparently just too salty for them. The cacti don't seem to mind the salty soil though. So what's going on with cactus roots that enables them to tolerate such drastically salty soil? Nice native grass. It's nice not to see buffalo grass. What is that, a sporobolus, a panicum? Where are my grass people at? Oh, look, it's Billy Ternera. Cool Malvid, also presumably very salt tolerant. Cool, when I say Malvid, cool member of the uh, cotton family, Malvasi. Named after the illustrious Billy Turner, wild ass botanist out of Austin, Texas, who explored all over Texas, down into Mexico, etc. He was an eccentric guy here. Wish I could have met him. I met, his, I met his son. His son's pretty cool. His son wrote a book called Rare Plants of Texas, or Notable Plants of Texas, something. Shout out to his son. Oh, there's a horse crippler. Oh, that's nice. Echinocactus texensis. Now it's homolocephala texensis, I guess, upon molecular molecular DNA work that was done. It was discovered it's not as closely related to uh, the genus Echinocactus is formerly thought, so they brought back homolocephala. But uh, right next to that is uh, Manfreda. Looks like Manfreda longiflora, possibly. You get four or five different species. Close relative of agave. Oh, yeah, look, these leaves are so stiff. And notice the mottling. It's streaked instead of spotted. It can be a diagnostic factor. And when they flower, they get inflorescence. I'm not sure on this species of how tall it would be up. You know, but some of the manfreds can be upwards of 
six feet tall, six foot tall inflorescence. Get me afraid of virginica, of course. This one might, this one looks like it's probably gonna be a lot smaller, maybe a foot or two, but either way, really notable species. There's another one, another couple growing over there, seeing the shade of that Tasajillo. The little golf ball of the Kinosirius fitchii growing beneath it. And then, then switching over, looking over here, we got more Astrophytum. So Astrophytum, Manfreda, Echinocactus horizontalonius. Now it's, uh, of course, Humulocephala and Manfreda. Yeah, the, the inflorescence just gets about a foot tall on this one. You know, I've seen ones in the Oaxaca cloud forest that get six feet. But, uh, you know, closely related to agave, probably a sister genus. Someone was trying to lump them. I think that's kind of stupid. But, um... But uh, it's obviously got a much different form, but it'll hybridize with the gave. You get those mangave hybrids in cultivation. Look at the teeth on this thing. God damn it. And they can completely disappear during the dry season. Die back to the root, you won't see them. And then you get rain, everybody comes out. Just bursts for I mean, it is so brutal here in the summer. You know, we've been out here an hour. We probably last 15 minutes with no cover if this were the summer right there. Is that a little varilla seedling? Little man Fredo, look at that. Put this in your yard too, all right? Plant the little native cactus garden. You know, you really know you've made it when you get the rhabdotus snails showing up. Bring the rhabdotus into your yard. So many goddamn manfredas everywhere. You got a bunch under there too. See that? This, look at this compendium right here. Mammillaria hyri with this really cool lichen species. Kerry Canusa would know what that is. My guy Kerry over there, the lichenologist. But, uh, you know, these. this is the same one I used to see in Chihuahua Woods in Mission, Texas, growing under a light canopy of shade in these massive clumps with, you know, 20 heads. But apparently, they get a little bit more moisture. If they get a little bit more moisture, because we are in a low-lying area, they can take full sun. So in a garden, they could just take, you could plant those out in full sun. Kind of serious Enneacanthus, of course. One of the hedgehog cacti. Big pink flowers when it goes off with the green stigma like all the kind of serious have. Billy Ternera next to it, just wonderful habitat. It's a privilege to be here. And thank God the landowner put this into a conservation easement or put part of it into a conservation easement so it can be permanently protected. Not many people in the region would do that. There's really a, not much awareness or concern for this stuff, uh, which blows my mind in the region. It really is weird, I mean, Definitely, if there's a spot where a native plant community needs to grow, it's down here. Because this stuff is so cool. I think it's, you know, I think it's the thing once you, you know, turn people on to it, once they get a couple whiffs, it's undeniable how cool it is, how good it feels to be out around this stuff, to be surrounded by it, to grow it, to nurture it. You know, they get hooked. But you gotta, you gotta start somewhere. You gotta get people into it first. There's a little mushroom. You never see mushrooms in the desert except for some of the stock puffballs or, uh, or uh, what is it, Montagnia arenaria? Look at that guy, but this is actually a typical, typical stock and gilled mushroom. Still looking so elegant with those spines lit up. But look, here we got a Sphorelsia, which is a weird genus to see in this thick clay mud. Sphorelsia hastulata. See, because it's got kind of a, I suppose because it's got like kind of a hastate, uh, bottom of that leaf right there these triffid leaves kind of looking like the top of a wrought iron fence but just why that's wild to me to see because i always associate this with sandy deserts fast draining sands to see when that can tolerate clay why is this not being grown more this is a fucking banger genus look at that nice all those uh that hibiscus like flower with all those stamens pebble beds probably brought here i don't know five ten fifty thousand years ago by an ancient flood Beautiful horse crippler right here. Growing amongst the grass next to the varilla and a very dwarfed mesquite. I wonder how long before this thing dies. Again, they are just, these mesquites are stressed. You can see there's a bunch of dead ones over there. That salty soil is really, uh, they don't like it. Look at the beautiful, look at the trichomes. Look at those patterns of trichomes and that apical meristem. Like fuzz, like pillow fuzz. Like something you pulled out the dryer lint, you know? Nice betalane pigments and those emerging spines that are still growing that will elongate. So those those are still, oh Christ, Jesus, still soft. Another easy species to grow from seed, you know? Just got to keep that humidity up, grow them, uh, you know, half, half, half uh, pumice 
have some like decent soil, like the fox farm stuff, that organic shit that we grow. Just sift the fox farm soil so you get the bark chunks out, mix it 50-50 with the perlite, put it in a little enclosed container under some LED lights, they take off. Really easy to grow. I mean, you could get them probably this big in a, in a few years in cultivation where, they, again, apparently they're growing. Look, they're growing in this salty mud. Three, three days after a rain, it's still clumpy and wet. They can take a lot of moisture. Amorexia, Amorexia radii. That's a nice one. It's a nice flower. It's about a foot tall. It's a real nice flower when it goes off. Well, as if we're looking at this grass, whatever it is, it looks like uh, it's producing what could be edible grains. You know, maybe it might need a you know couple hundred to a thousand years of human domestication, but but I'm interested. It's thriving in this uh, this salty lowland. This is cool. Okay, now we're now we're like a, even a foot lower than where the astrophytum was. There's no astrophytum here. It's dominated by varilla. The mesquites are few and far between, and the soil is a lot muddier. So this is a little bit lower, probably much saltier, but retains moisture for longer. Really cool. I just love watching how these little these little eco zones piece together. We got intense flooding here still. So this is only you know we're just I don't know 40 feet downwind from the astrophytum. So can see they take a lot of they take a lot of rain i mean it's it's cooled off this is cool it's still like 85 degrees right now but this is the most uh this is the best you can hope for in the valley yeah you get a couple days in winter where it chills out but get this a triplex to the salt bush now an amaranthaceae formerly in kinopodiaceae now it's an amaranthaceae to kinopode subfamily same as quinoa but a triplex, I think it's a canthocarpa. I've only seen it in West Texas. I didn't know you get it in South Texas too. Much different habitat down here. Look at all this water here. See this this temporal little pond. You get that really cool toad. And so it only occurs in Star County in the United States, I believe. I believe it's mostly Mexican. It's Mexican burrowing toad. Rhinophrinus is the genus. Very, very uh comes out very uh unique on the, on the uh, amphibian phylogeny. But uh, they get this really weird call, and they just, they'll just they just float on top of the surface of the water and uh, let out this weird call. They spend like 90% of their life dormant, just burrowed in the mud. Love to eat termites out here. So these plants out here grow really slow in habitat. In cultivation, they grow a lot faster, okay? They don't grow... Out here, things don't grow on a continuum, okay? It's, it's, it's very short bursts and then long periods of dormancy, okay? It's like, you know, they, especially if you're a succulent, you just you charge up during a rain and you use that battery life throughout the long dry spell, whether it's six months or a year and a half, and, uh, and then, you know, eventually you get recharged again with another rain. But, you know, you can't view it. It's not, it's not like, you know, in like a deciduous woodland in a, in a you know, temperate forest where it's a continuum, all right, it's 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 you know long periods of dormancy and then very short rapid bursts of growth. And you bring a plant like this into cultivation where you can water it, especially you could you could dump water on it the warmer it is. When it's a hundred degrees outside, these things can take a lot more water. I mean, look, they're growing in fucking clay here, so they can grow really fast. I mean, you can get it that big in two or three years easily from a seed. But out here, it's just a whole different. Look at these things too. Those long periods of dormancy are what things have to deal with. All right, those long, well, long periods of drought, and then if things go into dormancy or they evolve stem, stem succulents or whatever. But all these plants are, look like this because they've been selected for, evolutionarily speaking, uh, by the environment, by the environment here. And the environment can be the soil, the climate, a combination of all those things. Obviously, the herbivores, the presence of herbivores is what gives plants like Tassa heel, those mean spines, and prickly pear, those mean spines. Whereas anything that doesn't have those things gets filtered out, gets picked off all right it's just natural selection that's the way it works long amounts of time and a multitude of factors selecting for various traits which uh, enable plants to survive and not not get filtered out uh, throughout the long course of a uh, time is it possible for something to be too nice could it be too nice underappreciated habitat look at that double header little little baby right there too little piece of shirt just incredible habitat what a privilege Hopefully it's uh, still around 50, 100 years with all these species still in it, you know. But you could definitely do your part. Kill your lawn, get rid of it. Even just kill a little patch. Start putting some of this in. That soil here is what you need. That sandy, loamy clay soil. Like powder when it's dry. Like a thick, lumpy clay when it's wet. Anyway, that's all I got uh, for you today. Hopefully you had some out of that. Hopefully you got some out of that. Have a good rest of your day. Go fuck yourself. Bye.
Let's not forget the beautiful quote unquote pigeonberry ravinia humulus, humulus phytolacaceae, the pokeweed family. Look at those beautiful berries. Obviously, bird dispersed, probably toxic to people, though I don't know. Who knows? But uh, just a gorgeous plant. And obviously, all lit up here, loving the clay. Nice cobra linea, too. Another stem photosynthetic. Uh, a uh, spiny ass plant. This one's in the order of mustards, though, but in its own family, Cobra lineaceae. See those little fruits back there? That's how it gets around. It's bird dispersal.